Okay, so um, up until now, we've we've really only considered waves of one polarization. You know, to the extent we've even thought about the electromagnetic field as a vector field, all the pictures we've shown of amplitudes are assuming that all of the amplitude is in, say, the x direction. So the beam is propagating usually in the z direction, and we have the, the wave waving kind of up and down, maybe in the y direction, in and out in the x direction. Um, and, and we've assumed that all the, all the waves are, are just polarized in one direction. So we haven't had to worry about the vector nature of the electromagnetic field. And, and we've, we've looked at the amplitude of the field as a function of space and time and the intensity of the field, which is the magnitude of the amplitude squared. Uh, but today we'll start to look at the vector nature of the field. Now, because we're starting to look at the vector nature of the field, we're, we're gonna simplify everything else we can for a while. So, so for now, we're gonna work with just one color still, one color uh, wavelength frequency. So you know, toward the end of the class, we'll get into uh, fields composed of a whole slew of different wavelengths and frequencies and how do we analyze that and what happens when we pass the, that through interferometers. Um, initially, you might think there's just a big mess, but uh, interesting things interesting things happen. I will also keep the spatial structure of the wave very simple. So before we were talking about uh, Gaussian modes, and that's kind of a very complicated spatial structure. Uh, we'll, we'll go back to having the simplest spatial structure, which is just a plane wave. Plane wave. So, um, you know, in, in reality, we, we don't have plane waves because plane waves are infinite sheets of wavefront coming in a particular direction and nothing in physics is truly infinite. But you can think of these as the limit, limit uh, of, a very, uh, of a very fat Gaussian beam. So if you take that W naught parameter, the waste parameter, and, and make it very large, the wave fronts are all pretty, pretty perpendicular to each other. And in that limit, there's a plane wave. So I'll talk about passing lasers through various polarizers and wave plates and other devices that muck with the polarization. Uh, and, and you can keep in mind that the laser beam really is a, a Gaussian beam, but all the math will, will sort of take it in the limit of a very wide wide beam and we're just looking at plane waves. So we don't have to worry about the spatial structure. Uh, and, and with these two simplifications, we can actually start talking about the vector nature of light. And then after we've talked as much as we can about that, then we can start introducing these other, these other complications again. So, so let's, let's review what does a complex, complex plane wave look like? So a complex plane wave. Um, we, we usually talk about this E plus field of R, which is some E naught plus some constant in, in space times E to the I KZ. And uh, we said before for plane waves, the, one of Maxwell's equations in vacuum, where the divergence of E is zero, if we have this spatial structure, this implies, this implies that the, since the, the only spatial dependence is in the Z direction, if we take this gradient, or this divergence here, sorry, the divergence, um, the, X component of the divergence is automatically zero. The Y component of the divergence is automatically zero. The Z component of the divergence just brings down this I K and that gets multiplied by the Z component of the electric field. And in order for that to be zero in, in vacuum away from sources, that means that the Z component of the field has to be zero or E Z, let me call this E plus naught. The, the, the vector uh, Z component has to be zero. And, and the X and Y components can be whatever they want. And it's, so, so when we talk about the polarization of the electromagnetic field, it's always gonna be the polarization perpendicular to the direction of travel. So the, elect, 
the electric field cannot point in, in the direction of travel. It can have no component in the direction of travel because of this Maxwell equation. And so polarization is all just how, how much of that vector is pointed in x versus pointed in y, and how does that change over time and over space? Uh, so, so if we were to write this as a function of both space and time, we would keep the same constant, keep the same e to the i kz, and we would have to add in a minus omega t to, to put in the time dependence. And uh, if we were to go back here and examine what, what do we have left, well, we have, we have two more complex constants that, that can be not zero. There's e naught in the x direction and plus and e naught in the y direction plus. And these are each complex numbers. And I'll remind you of the interpretation of these complex numbers in a little bit, but they have a magnitude and a phase. And let me write the magnitude for reasons you'll see in a second as a half e naught x without the plus. So this is a real, real number. This will be the amplitude of the real wave in the x direction and a phase e to the i by x. And same thing here, e to the, oops, e to the i by y. And you'll see that the, the reason why I have this half here is that when we write the real wave, write the real wave, can you still see that now, the markers? Starting to fade here. When we write the real wave, E of R and T, this is always E plus, E plus of R and T plus the comp plus this complex conjugate. So I could write this as E minus of R and T, but I could also just think of it as a complex conjugate of this. And the complex conjugate applies to both the, the Z and the T parts, but also the, the stuff out here. And these should all be vectors, sorry. Okay, so, so let's actually, um, let me write what this is in, in uh, let me write what this is on the top using, using this, and we'll see why the half is there. And then we'll really start to look at the actual spatial components of the, the real wave. So E, the real wave of R, T is going to be two components. There's a half E naught in the X direction without the plus. This is a real, a real number, E to the I phi X, E to the I KZ minus omega T plus its complex conjugate. All of this is in the x hat direction, plus similar thing, half e naught y e to the i by y. Um, e to the i kz minus omega t plus its complex conjugate in the y hat direction. And if I take this thing plus this complex conjugate, I, I can combine that into a cosine. So remember, uh, cosine is half e to the plus stuff plus a half e to the minus stuff. So if I take this whole thing plus this complex conjugate, I can write this as one half, oh, sorry, the halves, the halves go away. That goes into part of the cosine. This is just e naught e naught x cosine of everything up here. So k z minus omega t plus by x, all this in the x hat direction, plus a similar thing, e naught y cosine of k z minus omega t plus by y in the y hat direction. <clears throat> 
And let me switch to my other markers here. Y, Y, and in the Y hat direction. There we go. That's much better. Okay. So it looks like there are four parameters here to define this plane wave going. So the plane wave going purely in the Z direction. Um, the time dependence of the plane wave is fixed. Oh, and let me just, for sort of reference here, K, K as a vector, you would write it as zero, zero, K here. This only, ha only has a Z component. Um, K itself is two pi to the wavelength. And the wave equation relates omega to K just by the speed of light. So just so that everything is fixed. So once you fix the, the wavelength and once you fix that it's in the Z direction, this form is unique. And you still have what seem like four parameters to choose. There's the amplitude of the X component, the phase of the cosine and the X component, the amplitude in the y, of the Y component and the phase of the Y component. And all four of those are, are really free choices. You can make them to be whatever you want. Uh, but let, let me talk about certain combinations of those choices that that, uh, that make more or less sense to, to talk about. And uh, again, as I'm erasing, feel free to ask lots of questions. Okay, so so first, let's talk about the intensity. Intensity is uh, is one over two times this eta parameter, this thing in ohms, three hundred seventy-seven ohms, just to get into the right units, times the time average of e dot e. Time average of the intensity. Uh, so, sorry, times the time average of the amplitude of the electric field. So this is like the magnitude squared of the vector time averaged. And if we were to write this out, this would be uh, one over two eta times, okay, so e dot e, this is e naught e naught x squared times cosine squared in the x direction. And the time average of cosine squared is a half. So there's another half here, plus e naught y squared times the time average of this cosine squared, which is a half. So I could write, I can combine these halves into a fourth, um, or I could write them back here as the, oh, I erased it down here. Oh no, it's over here, good. I could write this over here. I could say, instead of having a half e naught x uh, squared, I could write this as, as uh, uh, the magnitude of e naught x plus squared e naught y plus all that magnitude squared. Okay, so the sum of the squares of these determine the intensity of the wave. So the, you know, like the number of milliwatts uh, or millo, you know, the milliwatts of the beam or the milliwatts per square millimeter of the beam, um, that, that determines the intensity. So one combination of these parameters is something we've already talked about that is kind of in, independent of the polarization. Um, another parameter is, is these phases. So what, what I want to argue is that it's only really the relative phase that's going to matter in terms of the pictures that we show of polarizations. And the reason is uh, changing, changing these phases together is just the same as changing either our origin or changing our, our what we call t equals zero. And nowhere in optics do we actually control the you know, the, the time that the laser happens to peak versus the time that the laser happens to go through zero versus the time it happens to be a negative. So nowhere in optics do we actually control time to that, 
10 to the minus 15 uh, level in terms of the, the phases of these waves. So we often, since we only care about the relative phase here, uh, we can either explicitly work with just the relative phase, or we can just declare, let's just say that we're going to pick an uh, origin in time such that this x phase is zero by declaration. And the only thing we have to worry about is the y phase. So that kind of gets rid of two parameters. There's an intensity parameter and an overall phase that, uh, that are separate from describing the polarization. And then there are really two parameters that describe the polarization itself, which is how much of that intensity gets distributed between x and y. So you take your total intensity and you say, well, some of it's going to be in the x direction, some of it's going to be in the y direction. And then also how much phase there is. What is the relative phase between the x and the y? So to describe the polarization, we just need kind of a ratio of amplitudes and a single phase to describe all that. And, and that gives us the, the polarization state itself. And on top of that, you could add the total intensity of the beam, or you could, uh, uh, you could, uh, uh, and then uh, oh, defining the, the time equals zero is the other, is the other thing. So, so let me write this, this E not like this, but more as, as a, a vector. So I'm going to go back to the complex, the complex E just so that I can have sort of motivate my next move here. So E plus, I'm going to write this as a vector as E, E X plus E Y plus, and since our plane wave is going in the Z direction, zero. And now I'm going to plug in, plug in all this stuff here. So uh, this is going to be uh, E, E naught uh, X, E to the I phi X, a half E naught Y, E to the I phi Y, zero, all of this times the E to the I kz minus omega t. And the way we're going to describe the polarization of the wave is just to focus on the top, the top two components of this vector. So of course, you know, the actual vector is a three-dimensional vector in three-dimensional space. Um, and the actual vector is also real, right? This is the expression for the real the real vector. But uh, to make our lives easy in terms of describing the polarization of the beam, we're just going to focus on the x and y components, and we're just going to focus on uh, the, the part right here that, uh, that we know in order to construct the complex thing, we have to multiply by a half, and we have to multiply by this complex exponential. And then to construct the real thing, we have to add its complex conjugate. But we're just going to focus on this little, little, uh, little top part here. Uh, to just describe the polarization. And that's going to be called the Jones vector. And there's a whole um, calculus associated with manipulating the polarization of the beams. And the simplest way to start describing that is just with the Jones vector, this little two, two by one column vector. And for those of you who are taking physics 116 or have taken 116, this should start to look really familiar. And I'm not 100% sure of the history of this. I think that uh, I think that these it's, it's possible that the the quantum stuff happened slightly before the the optics writing the optics stuff in this in this particular formalism. But I, I think they uh, maybe in the 30s and 40s uh, both both kind of quantum mechanical spins and and optics started started writing things in this notation. So. Well, the Jones vector for this beam is just this two by one matrix. Some amplitude of some intensity here, uh, some amplitude e to the i phi x, and e naught y e to the i phi y. And once I once I give you these two numbers, these two complex numbers, you can break them up into their magnitude and their phase, and you can plug them in to this equation. And this gives you the real honest to God 
uh, electric field that's going everywhere in space. But rather than working with this whole expression with the cosines and the kz and the omega t, all that stuff is going to come, come along for the ride. And we're just going to manipulate the amplitudes and the phases of the x and the y components of, of a beam that we know is propagated. We know it has a single wavelength. We know it's time dependence. We know it's spatial dependence. We're just going to manipulate its, its polarization. Uh, OK, so one thing that I haven't discussed at all is the magnetic field. And you know, I, I, I mentioned this before, but the magnetic field just comes along for the ride. Whenever there's a propagating electric field, you can always just plug it into Faraday's law or plug it into Ampere's law and get what the propagating magnetic field associated with that is. So, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm never going to talk about the magnetic field. And when we say a beam is polarized in the x direction, we're going to mean that its electric field is oscillating in the x direction. Now, of course, we know that the magnetic field is perpendicular to that. So the magnetic field is going to be oscillating in the opposite direction. We still say this is polarized in the x direction. And the reason why we're focused mostly on the electric field is that when you make electromagnetic waves or detect electromagnetic waves, either with an antenna or with uh, you know, atomic absorption in the case of light, it's usually the electric field that, that does most of the work. And so uh, focusing on the electric field is, it makes sense because it's the electric field that ends up making and, and, uh, making and absorbing the light typically. And then you know, the magnetic field comes along for the ride once it starts propagating out. So that's why we're focused on the electric field. I have one more note here, uh, which is, OK, so, so this is our Jones vector. And to further simplify things, let me, let me do two, two moves, which are the same two moves I talked about before. We're going to kind of factor out an overall intensity, and we're not going to worry about an overall intensity. And that's the same as just normalizing this, this Jones vector. So just like in quantum mechanics, you would normalize the spin to be one. In, in optics, we sort of separately keep track of the intensity of the beam, you know, what, what you would measure if you put a power meter in the beam, and the polarization. And the way we do that is, is we just normalize this, this vector to one. So we'll sort of move number one will be to factor out, factor out uh, overall amplitude. E naught, which is just square root of E naught x squared plus E naught y squared. So just factor that out so that this, this is normalized. And just like in quantum mechanics, we will set the top part to be a, a real number typically. So usually, usually set, set phi x uh, equals zero. So top is positive real. So that, that will be our starting point. And now we're going to talk about some, some different examples of this, um, some different examples of polarization. And I'll show some pictures and, uh, and uh, some animations. So maybe I'll erase this stuff here. OK, so um, I will even write it in, in the language that looks very quantum mechanically, because all of this is going to translate right into the quantum state of the electromagnetic field. So right now, we're just describing a classical wave. But uh, the, uh, the, all of this is going to apply exactly to quantum, quantum states. So just here, we're describing the intensity of a wave that you can manipulate and measure as if it were a continuous thing. All the same things are going to apply photon by photon by photon. And nothing, nothing changes in terms of this polarization when we quantize it. So I'm going to write a horizontally polarized state as 1, 0. So this, this has all of its amplitude in the x direction and no amplitude in the y direction. And we're setting the phase to be 0 in the x, so it's positive and real. And so on on a xy diagram, if you're looking, looking along the beam, uh, 
the electric field would oscillate back and forth horizontally along the x direction. Similarly for vertical, we we'll write that as zero one. This would be, if you're looking along the beam, it's a electric field oscillating in the vertical direction. And then there's what we call a diagonal D and that's gonna be, let me, let me actually write, write what this equals before I write what it corresponds to. So this is uh, one over root two H plus one over root two V and this corresponds to one over root two times one, one. And this, this is a beam if you look at these cosines here. So it's as if the phases were zero. So phi x is zero, phi y is zero. And so the cosines are oscillating together and the amplitudes are the same. And so if the cosines are oscillating together, the amplitudes are the same. That looks like a wave that's at 45 degrees um, oscillating in the positive x, positive y direction, and then in the negative x, negative y direction. And then there's, of course, the perpendicular to that, which we call anti-diagonal A. There is a little bit of half of the amplitude being horizontal or half of the intensity being horizontal minus half of the intensity being vertical. And this just corresponds to one over two, one minus one. Oops, that's not how I write a minus one. One minus one. And that is that is oscillating in the negative direction. So when it goes up in X, it goes down in Y. And when it goes, so that's this this way. And when it goes down in X, it goes up in Y. So this is the uh, oscillating, oscillating there. So let me show you a, a movie of that. Uh, hold on. Let me paste, I will paste the YouTube link in, into the chat, uh, just in case the, the screen share video doesn't work very well. Although I think there's a simple enough video that should be able to compress just fine. Okay, let me share the screen. Okay, so, oops, here's a YouTube video. Um, here we're gonna show, first of all, we're gonna show diagonal polarization. So even though these two things are perpendicular, they're both electric fields, right? This is the electric field. Uh, I guess here they're calling it, I guess here the wave is propagating in the X direction. So they're calling it EZ and EY. But for us and for, uh, you know, quant quantum, we would normally think about everything. Z is always a special direction in the in advanced physics. So this wave is going to propagate in the Z direction and the electric field is going to have some component in the Y direction and some component horizontally in the X direction. And here, when the two components are in phase, like in the example I just showed for, for D and A, um, the two electric fields are, are going to oscillate in their cosine pattern in phase. And pretty soon they'll They'll show the vector sum of these. And this is the picture of the, uh, the green is the sum, the net electric field, and it, it's oscillating diagonally. So it's going positive and x, positive and y, negative x, negative y. So let me finish that video. They're gonna back up and do something in a second, which I'll first talk about. Okay, let me stop sharing. All right, so, so one thing that's a little bit misleading about those pictures is remember we're talking about plane waves and all those pictures, they usually show one, one line and they show the electric field at every point along that one line. Really in a plane wave, every single line going in the Z direction has the identical electric fields. It would just be a huge mess to show, to show all of that. But that means that if at some location in Z, the electric field is pointing up and to the right, that means at every, everywhere in that plane, the electric field is pointing up and to the right. And then a little bit further on, the electric field is gonna be pointing down and to the left and everywhere in that plane, the electric field is pointing down to the left. It's a whole wave of 
uh, electric fields coming at you. All right, so the next thing they're going to do in that animation is to delay one of these cosines by a quarter of a wavelength. So they're going to delay cosine by a quarter of a wavelength. And if you delay cosine by a quarter of a wavelength, you turn cosine into sine. And delaying by a quarter of the wavelength is the same as shifting its phase by pi over 2. And so I'm going to let phi y equal pi over 2. Um, and e to the i pi over 2, oh, this is just i. So that's on the complex plane, if this is real and imaginary. If I delay by a quarter of a turn, I turn real into imaginary. And that that we're gonna we're gonna see in a second why this is called that. Uh, but that is gonna be called left, left circular polarization. So this is gonna be one over root two h plus i. You see that barely i over root two v, or uh, the representation of that as a Jones Jones vector would be one over root two one i, and this is going to spin around like this. And let me share the video again and, and play play uh, play the rest of it here. So circular polarization. OK, so now they're going to delay one component by a quarter of a wavelength. And now they're going to plot the two, the x and the y vectors. And as soon as they show the vector sum, you'll see that the vector sum is going to rotate around the axis. So it's always going to have the same magnitude is just going to rotate in time or in distance. So this is circularly polarized. They have a little comment there where if the magnitudes weren't the same, um, it wouldn't trace out a circle. It would trace out an ellipse. And we would say that's elliptically polarized. So let me see. I think that's basically the end of the video. I will pause. I'll stop sharing the screen. Um, there's also, of course, uh, the opposite here, right, right circular polarized, where the signs are just going to flip. So this is 1 over root 2 h minus i over root 2 v. So 1 over root 2, 1 minus i, minus i. Really running out of room here. And this one's going to go in the opposite direction. Um, let me show you uh, a different, a different uh, tab here. So this is just the Wikipedia page for circular polarization. They have some nice animations. And one thing that they point out in this Wikipedia page, which, which is true, is that different people or different uh, fields of study define right and left oppositely, which is super annoying. So let me motivate why, why there's not an obvious definition for right and left. So let's look at this first picture here. Uh, let me see. Let's look at these, this, this picture here. So if you if this wave is propagating in the z direction what what we in optics do is we take our fingers and we curl it along this spiral and if we do that with our right hand and curl it along the spiral uh, the our thumb points in the z direction and so in optics, if this is a snapshot of a wave and we curl our fingers around in the, uh, in the direction that, that this field is, is spinning with our right hands, uh, we get the direction of propagation. Uh, let me see. Uh, 
got down here. So here's an animation of that happening. And here's an animation of the opposite. So uh, actually, let me see here. Yeah, so, so for this one, it's a little, I wish I could pause these animations. So if you pause this animation and curl your fingers around in the direction that it's going, um, it would give you a left-handed, yes, yes, a left-handed spiral. Now, the reason why different people choose different conventions is that if you look at, oh, so, so, so by the way, any wave uh, propagating, it's the, if you take a snapshot at some instant in time and then you let the wave propagate forward, the whole thing just shifts. So these animations are great because it's a frozen, a frozen snapshot in time that's shifting forward, which is how we usually think of the wave equation. We, we have some function, and then we, instead of having some spatial function, we plug in some, some f of z minus velocity times time. And the whole function just shifts in the z direction. Now, if you think about it as staying in one place, though, and, and asking what happens to the vector at one place, the vector op rotates in, in, the, in the direction opposite of what, of what you think here. So, so this, sorry, th this picture down here is what I've called the right-handed circular polarized light. And this picture on top would be the opposite one. And if you look at what happens at the origin here, the vectors, the electric field vectors rotating in, in the opposite direction, right? So in order to go forward in space, you have to curl your fingers in one direction. If you're stuck in space and you're asking what happens as a function of time, you're, you're going, uh, you're curling in the opposite direction. And so some people think of the spatial pattern and, and draw their, you know, either use their left and right hand to ask what the spatial pattern is doing and other people look at a single place and ask what is the electric field doing at a single place. And the optics convention tends to be pause it in time and ask what is the whole thing doing? And other conventions like in radio astronomy and uh, in antenna design and engineering, you know, since the antennas are, are locked in place, they're asking what happens at that particular place as a function of time. So, so there's two different conventions and we'll stick with the optics convention. Uh, and let me let me motivate a little bit why. Well, actually, so you can see it right here. Uh, let me stop this stop this animation. I'll show you I'll show you why why we do that. So let me I will get rid of this. Now, you know I'm going to spend spend a little bit of time talking about this, but honestly, it does it doesn't really matter. Once once you pick a convention, just stick with it and what you call right or call left almost has has no bearing on anything nothing actually you know goes off to the right it's something that is spinning using the right hand rule or the left hand rule at rates that we can never actually detect uh, but you can tell the difference between the two by uh, by doing certain optical experiments that I'll well you can tell that they are different by doing certain optical experiments that I'll talk about next time but you can't you can't really tell what is what without resolving the actual time time behavior. So, um, you know, think of this kind of definition of left-handed, right-handed as a bit of a, a convention. Also, I would say that the easiest way to think about this, and I don't let me see if I could switch cameras for a second. This may or may not work. So this is a drill bit, and if I, I don't, I don't actually know if I have my camera mirrored or not here. But uh, drill bits and screws are all right-handed in our optic sense. If I take my right hand and I wrap it around this drill bit very carefully, um, it and clearly this is the forward direction. It's wrapping it around the drill bit, uh, I I get the right the the right sense when I use my right hand, and I can. If, if you want to sort of verify all the things I said yourself, 
you can either stare at those animations for a while or you can get a, a big drill bit or a big screw or something and just ask what happens if I'm locked at one, at one spot and I let this whole drill bit pass by. Um, where, where does the, the cutting teeth on the drill, how does that move? And that actually, that spins around in the opposite direction, then I would have to spin my hands in order to go in the forward direction. So, so you could do this with a drill bit or a screw. They're all right-handed, um, except for very obscure ones that you might find on the one of the two pedals of your bicycle. I think that's the only time I've ever encountered a screw that was not right right-handed. Um, but you know, taking taking something like this will will help you think through some of these uh, some of these issues of of why why does the electric field sort of spin in the opposite direction than the in time as it does in space. But let me switch cameras and let me just motivate that a slightly different way. So, so let's actually do this. Let's, let's, let's write what is the real field for, um, well, since, since the drill is right-handed, I'll, I'll use the right-handed example. So um, a right circular polarized example here. Uh, Right, circular polarized example. So if I were to write the real electric field of a right circular polarized beam, V of R T, um, there's some overall amplitude that I'm not so worried about. And I'm gonna write this as cosine, cosine of K Z minus omega T in the X direction plus a shifted version of this cosine in the y direction. And that, that is actually a sine of kz minus omega t. So if I shift a cosine by 90 degrees in this, in this sense, I get a sine y hat direction. Um, let me plug in k and omega to write it sort of in the more familiar form of a propagating wave. So this is cosine of two pi over lambda c minus ct plus sine of two pi over lambda c minus ct. And now, uh, here you can see a little bit better where, where the difference in sign comes from. So if I were to take my drill bit and wrap my fingers around it, as I go forward in Z, what happens is uh, I start out at a, a high, high value in the X direction. Oops, I forgot my, my vectors here. High value in the X direction. And so this is all at t equals zero and the, and the zero value in the y direction. And as time goes on, I, uh, I go up in the y direction. I'm oh, sorry, this is not this is left circular polarized. Oh, no, 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 this is, this, this is right. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, okay. So as a function of z, I'm going to start out all x, but then I'm going to go up in z as I go forward in z. Sorry, I'm going to go up, up in y as I go forward in z. But if I stay at the origin, if I set z equals zero, then what happens is as I, as I start the time animation, uh, because of these negative signs here, um, the, the vector is going to to go down in Y. So that's why in this picture here for right circular polarization, um, if we start out all the way in the X direction and I let time advance, uh, the electric field vector is gonna start to have some negative, negative Y component. Whereas the left circular polariz polarization, if I start out with all X and I let time go forward, uh, this picture is gonna show some, uh, some right polarization. So, so if you ask, is this left or right with respect to what? Uh, 
it is not actually left or right with respect to the z-axis, which would point out of the page. Right, this is left or right with respect to the, the uh, z-axis that points into the page. So uh, this would be uh, not from the sender's perspective, but from the receiver's perspective. So again, almost all of this stuff is uh, something you don't actually have to worry about once we sort of lay down these definitions. But I'm just trying to motivate uh, why different people might choose different conventions and motivate the particular conventions that we choose, which is freeze it in time and ask what does what this spiral pattern look like in space? That determines whether we call it left or right. Even though at a particular space, point in space, the, the vector might spin opposite of what, what you would think in time. Okay, so you know, with that said, I'm never gonna really uh, obsess too much about the spatial pictures of right versus left, uh, but we will manipulate these Jones matrices. So we'll take horizontal polarization and, or sorry, these Jones vectors, we'll take horizontal polarization and send it through some optical element and get out a diagonally polarized uh, beam or get out a circular polarized beam. And as you might expect, the way to manipulate Jones vectors would be Jones matrices. And that is what we'll talk about next time. And uh, this, these Jones matrices will look a lot like quantum mechanical evolution operators. They'll be unitary. Um, you know, they have to preserve, unless we're actually blocking a polarization, they will preserve the, the intensity of the beam. They'll preserve the norm. There's a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of analogs here. All right, so let me let me pause and ask for questions, and we'll we'll pick up the manipulation the manipulation of polarization next time. But just remember that with these Jones vectors, the top always just corresponds to the amount and the phase of the x component of the electric field, and the bottom always corresponds to the amount and phase of the y component electric field. All right. There are no questions and I will see you on Wednesday. And uh, the homework has nothing to do with polarization. So you have a little bit of time to, to uh, absorb this. All right, see ya.